Good morning, everyone. Well, it's week 29. We're in our study of Job 7, and uh, there are some really interesting uh, comments to be made about our scripture today. But let's just open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for the wisdom that's in it, for the encouragement that we get from you, and most of all, thank you for your Holy Spirit that watches over us. In your Son's name, amen. Well, as we always do, let's just uh, get the cobwebs out and kind of remind ourselves uh, some of the lessons from last week. If you remember in chapter 6, we heard Job's second speech, a response to his friend Eliphaz. And if you recall, Eliphaz was uh, in some way trying to backhandedly encourage Job, but probably just more than likely just offended him or discouraged him. Well, Job admitted that his words were indeed rash, but he explained that it was because of the excessive heaviness of his grief. And we have to just realize and remember that God understands. He created us, and he knows what sin has done to us as it's entered this world. But God does not cast Job aside because of his strong language. No, he listens to him uh, and loves him just the same. So Job insists that he has a reason for his grief. In fact, it, it's com almost comical. He says, doesn't the donkey bray and doesn't the ox bellow when they don't have enough food? And using the same analogy, Job is trying to make the point that he's not complaining without reason. We know the suffering that he has gone through and it's, he's almost at the breaking point. In fact, Job almost wishes for death. But for us, when the answer does not come, when instead of the release of cutting off life, we have continuing pain and great silence or imagined great silence from God, then we need to remember this story and remain confident that there is some explanation and that when it comes, when that explanation comes from God, we will be able to thank God as our eyes will be open to what he was trying to do. And in fact, as Job wishes for death or prays for death almost, in the same sense, when God responds to us and gives us an answer to why we went through the circumstances we went through, we'll be glad that he did not answer the request uh, or our thinking that death would be better. Well, Job understood he could not be the source of help within himself. And we're reminded that Job was not like a motivational self-help speaker encouraging himself to, to look within, trying to pull himself up by his own bootstraps, trying to find a hidden resource of help. Instead, his words from the pain-wracked man sitting on a burned-out place in a garbage dump indicate Job's absolute sense of helplessness. If Job's only help was within, then he had no help. But indeed, all success, as he says, was driven from him. In fact, the NIV translation of Job 6.13 can be helpful here because it says, do I have any power to help myself now that success has been driven from me? Those are the words of a distraught man who is suffering mightily. Job makes a demand for evidence and proof. This is part of his answer to Eliphaz, his friends. He turns to Eliphaz and says, you say that I'm suffering because of sin but you've never pointed anything out specifically. Teach me and tell me what my sin is. But until you do, there's no proof to your argument. So Job kind of stands up to Eliphaz here in this, in, we saw last week. And then finally, the climax of Job's reaction to his friend's counsel came last week. They offered no help. That's Job's assessment of the speeches that they gave. It was one thing to sit with him and suffer with him, but then when they try to give speeches and include his own sin as the reason for his suffering, then Job reacts. So the verses are like a sermon here. We can learn, and I use this quote from the theologian Smick. He says, the verse is like a sermon about the special strength needed to be willing to make oneself available when we see others in a truly dreadful condition. The risk involved can make us afraid, hesitant to even offer some help. Have you found yourself in that situation 
where someone needs some help and it looks overwhelming, but you're hesitant because you're thinking maybe they will draw upon you and ask more of you than you can really offer or give. The risk always involved when we look to help others can make us afraid and hesitant to even offer the help that is required. Well, our passage today then, Job 7, let's begin and take a look at that. It starts with, is not all human life a struggle? That's how Job begins. And in this, Job identifies our common struggle. No one is immune from the struggle of daily life or calamities that occur for everyone. That is the common part uh, for humankind. And our lives, Job goes on, are like that of a hired hand, like a worker who longs for the shade, like a servant waiting to be paid. Well, in fact, Job felt there was no hope or reward, only weariness. And the words hired hand in Job 7.1 are, according to Adam Clark and other theologians, actually descriptive of military service. The Latin Vulgate translates it this way, the life of man is a warfare upon earth. And the early English Coverdale translation said it this way, is not the life of a man upon earth a very battle? So with this, Job is communicating both the struggle of life together with the idea that he has been drafted unwillingly, unwillingly into this battle. It's hard enough to go through the suffering, but to do it unwilling, to not sign up as it were for it. Uh, to not be in a volunteer army, but rather a drafted army. All right, verse 3, Job goes on. I, too, have been assigned months of futility, long and weary nights of misery. Can any of you relate to that? In our lifetime, sometimes we have those terrible long nights where a problem is plaguing us, plaguing us or uh, physical pain is dogging us, or worry about a loved one happens. Night so often when our minds are still seems to be jarred into a time of wakefulness and worry that is miserable and no relief comes. All right, verse four, lying in bed, Job says, I think when will it be morning? But the night drags on and I toss until dawn. My body is covered with maggots and scabs. My skin breaks open, oozing with pus. Ugh, that's a pretty vi visual that uh, we don't like to focus on, but this was the suffering of Job. This was his fate. And then to get no relief, not even from a night of sleep, it just was hideous for him, and he is expressing that. So then Job does the right thing. He cries out to God. Verse six, my days fly faster than a weaver's shuttle. They end without hope. So for Job, time is dragging by. For Job, there is no sleep. He has sleepless and painful nights, which exacerbates the things that he is suffering. Yet when he looked at his life in totality, it seemed to be a meaningless blur, spent without hope, just as a breath is seconds. Verse 7, O oh God, remember that my life is but a breath, and I will never again feel happiness. That really is registering, by, uh, Job is registering deep, deep uh, sorrow and depression um, with that verse. So here we see Job, though, being so honest with God, laying out his feelings of despair. And God welcomes us to do that. He wants us to cry out to him. He wants us to express what's on our heart, particularly in those low, low moments. Verse 8. You see me now, but not for long. You will look for me, but I will be gone. Just as a cloud dissipates and vanishes, those who die will not come back. They are gone forever from their home, never to be seen again. I cannot keep from speaking. I must express my anguish. My bitter soul must complain. Well, here we see Job is, is just expressing the depth of his despair. And he's recognizing that life is really, really short. And uh, for the Old Testament faithful to God, they didn't have a completed sense of what eternity might be with God. And so the despair and the, the potential for rest 
uh, by death was present in many of them. And then again, he, he does the right thing. He says, I must express my anguish. My bitter soul must complain. Well, here's a, a, kind of a, an interesting verse that we'll have to look at, verse 12. Job says, am I a sea monster or a dragon that you must place me under guard? So, so what is he saying here? Um, I'll give you the quote from Spurgeon in a moment, but just to unpack this just a little bit, he is, he is saying that something that can cause major upheaval, something that is larger than life, like a whale, a sea monster, uh, something huge that has the potential to wreak havoc on a large scale basis, that's something that God should look at. But just an insignificant man like Job, that's nothing that God should pay attention to in a sense. And so as Spurgeon says it, um, to argue from our insignificance is really poor pleading. For the little things are just those against which there is the most need to watch. In other words, Spurgeon is saying that, you know, we can lose a soul, we can lose our soul due to the pileup of just little insignificant or they seemingly insignificant but damaging sins. Spurgeon goes on, if you were a sea monster, a dragon or a whale, God might leave you alone. But as you are a feeble and sinful creature, and I add here one that he loves and cares about, which can do more hurt than a sea monster or a whale, you need constant watching. Do not say, like Job, am I a sea monster that you must keep a watch over me? For the Lord may answer, you are more able to do evil, have the pro proclivity towards evil more than a wild sea monster. And Guziak, David Guziak, he says, we are more like a dragon than we would like to admit. A dragon is restless and so is our nature. A dragon can be furious and terrible and so can we. A dragon can never be satisfied and neither can sinful man. A dragon may breathe fire and sometimes our loosened tongues breathe fire. A dragon is mischievous and destructive, and so is sinful man. A dragon will not obey, and neither will a sinful man. Only God can tame the dragon in us. Interesting, right? All right, verse 13, Job continues. I think my bed will comfort me, and sleep will ease my misery. But then, O oh God, you shatter me with dreams and terrify me with visions. So Job is suffering. Job is looking for sleep just to get a break from what he is suffering, the sores on his body. And it doesn't come. He's awake. But then when he does fall asleep, then he says to, to God, God, not only can I not sleep much, but when I do, then you torture me with dreams, terrifying visions. So Job, Job, Job was denied even the comfort of sleep and rest. When he lay down to sleep upon his bed or couch, he was disturbed with nightmarish dreams and terrifying visions. He needed rest by sleep, but was afraid to close his eyes because of the horrid images which were presented to his imagination. Could there be a more deplorable state than this? That's what theologian Clark asks, that you, you want sleep, you want relief, and not only do you not get it, but then on top of it, you get terrifying images and dreams. I can't think of worse suffering. Verse 15, I would rather be strangled, rather than die than suffer like this. Again, Job is not afraid. He doesn't mince words. He's not afraid to tell God how he's feeling in his pit of despair. So worse than the disease itself, Job lost all hope of being healed. He believed his only release from pain was death. That's what theologian Smick tells us. Well, verse 16, I hate my life and don't want to go on living. Job's condition is so miserable that at this point, his soul would prefer the release of death. Oh, leave me alone for my few remaining days. This is what Job says in the latter part of verse 16. Can there be any more honest conversation with God than this? If God will hear this from Job, we must uh, see that there is nothing, nothing that we can't bring to God in a conversational prayer. 
He hears our complaints, he hears our concerns, and he, out of love, acts on them. Verse 17, what are people that you should make so much of us, that you should think of us so often? Now, does this verse uh, remind you of something? Is this verse familiar, this uh, asking of Job, what are people that you should make so much of us? Well, think about Psalm 8, 4, which I've given you here. In that one, David says, what is man that you should think of him? the son of man, that you should care for him. So what we see here is that given the book of Job was more than likely written around 2000 to 1800 BC, and Psalms is dated around the time of 1400 BC, it appears that perhaps David took Job and his sorrowful inference of man's insignificance and weaves it into a psalm of praise. A description of God's greatness matched only by his compassion and love of we humans. This is an amazing thought. We are not insignificant to God, and we are on his mind continuously. Well, we see that Job rails a bit at what he calls God's constant testing. On one hand, he sees that, that God is paying attention, but then on the other, he can't help himself. He has to in a sense say, God, why are you testing me continuously? And in verse 18, we read, for you examine us every morning and test us every moment. Job just is complaining at what he calls God's constant testing, and uh, which causes Job to lash out in despair and ask, why won't you just leave me alone? Verse 19 then, why won't you leave me alone, at least long enough for me to swallow? If I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of all humanity? So you read those words, what have I done to you, O watcher of men? In other words, he's saying, please, God, just leave me alone. How have I wronged you? How have I sinned? And we can understand this, because Job didn't see the end of the story. It, what, he was in the midst of it. That's like us. We're in the midst of it. We haven't seen the end of the story. It hasn't come yet. Job could not understand why he seemed to be God's target. He didn't see, uh, knowing that he hadn't sinned, he couldn't understand what was causing all his suffering. So he asks God, why then do you not pardon my transgression? So here again we see in this in this verse that he knows he's right he knows he hasn't sinned and those sins that he has committed he asks for forgiveness uh, he repents and then he wonders why is he continuing to suffer why doesn't God pardon his transgressions and then Job says why make me your target so we hear of a person's and this is Spurgeon again. We hear of a person's being shadowed by the police, and certain people feel as if they were shadowed by God. They are mysteriously tracked by the great spirit, and they know and feel it. Wherever they go, an eye is upon them, and they cannot hide from it. Well, that's an interesting quote from Spurgeon, because essentially what it's saying is that God is omnipotent, he's omniscient, uh, he is constantly has his eyes on each of us. You remember, even in the... In the um, him, a very famous hymn, his eye is on the sparrow. There is nothing that is insignificant to God, particularly when it comes to us, his children. And so he is watching us. Job recognizes it, Spurgeon recognizes it, but maybe their thought is a little bit different. Some would say God is testing, watching, ready for me to trip, ready to strike me down. And others would say, in the grace of God, the mercy of God, he is watching me, protecting me, um, maybe allowing certain things in my life that I don't like, but those things which will help me grow, those things which will make me stronger and better. And so we have a picture here, uh, a dual picture, one of a tester who is, is looking for our destruction and one of a loving God who's extending grace to each of us and so constantly keeps a watchful eye over us. And then Job says, am I a burden to you? In other words, God, you know, am I bothering you? Am I a burden? Do you want me just to go away? Job wondered why God bothered with him at all. Its simple meaning was that God is so great that even if a man did sin, it cannot affect God. The answer is that this was altogether too small a thought of God. The truth being that God is so great 
that he is affected, wounded, robbed by a human sin. Let me say that again. It isn't insignificant. The answer is that this was altogether too small a thought of God, that God should not be bothered. The truth was that God is so great that he is affected and wounded and robbed by the smallest of human sin. And you can imagine how many of those small and significant sins pile up and collect in this world of ours. Job was, like his friends, hindered by the philosophy that was too narrow. His thought of God was that God was too small, too small to care, too small not to do anything about his suffering. Verse 21, why not just forgive my sin and take away my guilt? It's a reasonable question Job is asking, right? Well, Job's words here remind us of something remarkable. Though his physical suffering was intense and prolonged, as John Trapp wrote, his greatest troubles were inward. Job's spiritual crisis was deeper than his physical or material crisis. You've heard the, the comment that, you know, we can worry about some physical thing here in this life, which we should be thinking about the loss of our eternal soul. And so Job's crisis is eternal. It has to do with his soul, his belief in God, his trust in God, his faith in God. Not necessarily the physical crisis, the material crisis that he was suffering. Well, then he says two last things. First, he says, for soon I will die down in the dust and die. All Job has known about God, he still believes. He, he, we don't see any indication that he is giving up on God that what he knows of God is not still the same. But God's inexplicable ways have his mind perplexed almost to the broken, breaking point. Job is in the right, but he does not know that God is watching with silent compassion and admiration until the test is fully done and it is time to state his approval publicly of Job as we read in Job 42.8. We like to talk about having the faith to be healed, but what about having the faith to be sick? So just in this picture here and in this verse, we, we see this idea that uh, Job doesn't see the future. God sees the big picture. God sees eternity. Job doesn't, can't, and doesn't know that good will come and God will bring good. And he can't possibly know that relief will come and uh, reward will come. And then the second part of the idea here that I just really want us to focus on is sometimes it's easier for us to have the faith that we're going to be healed, but it's harder for us to have the faith that God is with us and can help us endure when we're in the midst of a trial, in the midst of a sickness, in the midst of a calamity. That's when it really takes some tremendous faith, particularly if it is a long test, a long-lasting test, one that seems to drag on forever. Well, then Job ends chapter 7 just with a simple statement, when you look for me, I will be gone. The transitory nature of life, physical life, um, needs to always be seen and understood in the understanding of eternal life. That is the soul with God forever. Well, a couple things I want you to consider for this week. In the quote from Mason above, he pushes us to consider what is more difficult, to pray in faith with confidence that God will heal us or to have the faith that God will give us everything we need to endure to overcome adversity, hardship, and pain. So I want you to ask yourself, can you identify times in your life where this has been the struggle for you? And what was the outcome? And how did God respond? And then our prayer focus for this week are these. Think of family and friends, acquaintances, who are in the midst of pain and struggle. Pray for them. Pray that they will remember and see the faithfulness of God in the midst of struggle and seek his strength, his comfort, and his deliverance. And then ask God to bring to your mind ways you can be the hands of God, giving encouragement or comfort or physical assistance of some kind. So that's our passage for this week. I look forward to being with you again 
Next week is we'll look at Job chapter 8.